Hi, everyone. In this recording, I will present the 2009 article titled Investment-Based Expected Stock Returns, published at Journal of Political Economy. And this is a paper joined with Laura Liu and Tony Whited. In this article, we take a first step at estimating the investment cap M on the cross-section of returns using GMM. The motivation of our work is straightforward. Empirically, there are many relations between firm characteristics and average stock returns in the cross-section. Now, realized returns equal expect returns plus abnormal returns. This identity is an accounting identity. Therefore, if any variable that can be used to forecast future returns, let's say accruals, let's say book to market, which is more well-known in finance. Let's say I can use book to market to forecast future realized returns. Automatically out of this accounting, accounting identity, there are two parallel interpretations. The first interpretation is that book to market is forecasting future abnormal returns. In other words, future pricing errors are forecastable. Forecasting errors are forecastable. That means a violation that violates the rational expectations hypothesis or efficient market hypothesis. And that's the standard behavioral interpretation. For example, a construction life and visionary that attribute that forecasting predictable forecasting errors to over extrapolation. Alternatively, you can work through the expect returns channel. In other words, book to market can be connected uh, with expect returns at the firm level. And we're gonna go through the expect return channel. In particular, we're gonna show that the investment model provides a systematic linkage between expected returns and firm level accounting variables. Let's take a preview of our key results. So I have right here two scatter plots. The left panel is for the sharp Littner cap M. The testing deciles are 10 standardized unexpected earnings deciles. So SUE stands for standardized unexpected earnings. This is the uh, accounting anomaly variable for the famous post earnings announcement drift that Pharma 1998 article calls the granddaddy of all anomalies. So extremely robust, uh, extremely influential, extremely puzzling to traditional asset pricing models. So, so we're using uh, equal weighted returns. Uh, this paper was written 10 years before uh, our later on replicating anomalies paper. So uh, we are using equal weighted uh, uh, testing portfolio returns in the main text and uh, we delegated the value weighted results in the internet appendix. So after all using equal weighted returns raises the high hurdle, raises the hurdle for any economic model to explain. So we're biasing our, uh, biasing the results in a way against us. So, but, but nevertheless, so in subsequent work, we all use value weighted returns. Right, for now, let's stick with the original paper. So we see that in the data, high SUE deciles earn Decile earn higher rates of returns on average than low SUE deciles. In the data, the spread is about 12 and a half, 13% per year and very big. Whereas if you look at the cap and predicted average return, expect return spread is virtually zero. It's pretty flat. The scatter plot is basically a horizontal cloud, meaning cap, cap and doesn't explain uh, post earnings announcement drift at all. The right panel is for the Pharma French three factor model. So um, the results are not that different from the cap um, in that the high SUE decile actually earn lower, somewhat lower rates of returns than low SUE deciles because um, um, high SUE firms uh, load the somewhat the, um, negatively on the um, value factor, uh, on the HML factor in the, in the three factor uh, specification, right? Whereas the low SOE decile loads more positively 
on the value factor. So in other words, so the three factor model also fails to explain the post earnings announcement shift anomaly. Um, next slide on the left panel, we have the standard consumption cap M. This is the standard power utility uh, with contemporaneous aggregate consumption growth as the factor and the consumption is measured using NIPA data, non-doables and services per capita. Okay, all fairly standard. So we see that the standard consumption cap M uh, cannot explain SUE anomaly either. Uh, again, we're looking at the horizontal cloud. If anything, the high SUE decile is predicted to earn somewhat lower rates of returns on average than the low SUE decile. The last panel is what we have out of the investment cap M, right? So we have 10 SUE deciles, they align roughly and not completely perfectly, uh, but you know, relative to the um, previous um, models, uh, we do pretty well. Okay, so high, high, high decile and low decile uh, virtually lying on the forty-five degree line. There are a little bit, little bit noise in the uh, in the intermediate eight deciles, but the errors are fairly small. So we're going to count this as um, vindication, as a, a successful indicator of our endeavor. The second anomaly we looked at is the book to market anomaly, the value anomaly. So um, uh, the left panel on the fir first model we try is again, the sharp Littner uh, standard cap M. Uh, we're using equal weighted um, returns again, although we use NYC breakpoints, again, using equal weighted returns raises the hurdle for all the model for all the economic uh, economic models to explain, I should point out that uh, in the online appendix of the paper, we reported all the evaluated results. The um, the outperformance of the investment model relative to the traditional asset pricing models is less uh, dramatic uh, with the value weighted returns as what we. Uh, have here with the equal weighted returns. In other words, using equal weighted returns um, uh, makes the investment model a more, more uh, stand out more. Okay. So, but the detailed evaluated results are reported um, in the in the online appendix anyway. All right. So uh, again, CAPM doesn't explain the value uh, premium. Um, again, if anything, slightly go negative way. Uh, the Pharma French three-factor model is doing somewhat of a better job, uh, although it still um, fails on the long end. And this is because uh, our testing portfolios are equal weighted and the, 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 the SMB and HML are value weighted within each portfolio. Uh, of course, when you do the two by three sorts and uh, there's a little bit of equal weighting once you do the average high minus average low. Uh, but but within each three port two portfolios, not average high book to market portfolios, and that's value weighted. All right. Bottom line is that because of the value weighting and the, the three factor model four short, you can see the large alpha for the value uh, decile average return. Consumption cap M um, performs a bit worse than the three factor model, not surprisingly. Now we see um, a negative alpha for the, for the value decile and positive alpha for the growth decile, all right? So high minus low, the model predicted spread is much lower than the observed spread in the data. And finally, uh, this is our uh, investment model. So uh, we do see some alphas along the way. Uh, but if you look at high minus low, we're generating a fairly uh, sizable average return spread, as you see in the data. The final set of anomalies we looked at is uh, Tittman, Wei, and Xie, uh, abnormal corporate investment decile. We are just short for corporate investment decile. So later on, we find out in our Q5 paper um, that Kowei Haitang Chen and I wrote um, um, quite a few years later. So we find out that corporate investment uh, actually confounds the information between um, corporate capex and, uh, and the sales. So it's not 
pure um, capex effect. So if we had the choice, uh, if we redo the paper, had to redo the paper, we would just be using Cooper Gulen Shows. Uh, total asset growth decimals, but back then, uh, Titman Wei and Share Paper was uh, was uh, was was the um, was the most prominent article. It's in fact the first article in the finance literature that talks about the investment premium. So let me give credit where well, credit is due. So it's a pretty important work. Uh, Titman Wei and Share Paper, 2040 FQA. So again, if you look at the data, it generates a pretty healthy spread. But if you look at the cap M, it's basically flat, right? So a little, so that the low minus high spread is you know weakly positive, but pretty tiny, close to zero. So Pharma French three factor model doesn't do much better. We're again looking at the horizontal cloud. Uh, standard consumption cap M is getting getting flipped. The low minus high is actually negative. Earns a negative premium, while in the data earns a, a large and positive premium. The last panel uh, scatter plot is what we have: the investment capital model. Uh, low investment decile indeed is predicted to earn higher rates of returns on average than high corporate investment decile. Uh, although for some of the intermediate uh, deciles, we do see some alphas in the sense that, you know, the scatter points are not exactly lined up along the 45 degree line. Right, so that's what we have. Bottom line is that the model performs pretty well. Um, I would say quite a bit better than the traditional asset pricing models. All right, so in the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna first uh, present the economic model and then I'm gonna describe how we take the model to the data uh, via structure estimation uh, GMN. All right, so, and then I'm gonna talk about the results, GMM estimation and testing results on matching uh, average return moments only. And then I'm gonna talk about the GMM estimation and test results from matching expect returns and the, and the variances of portfolios simultaneously. And finally, before I conclude, I'm gonna address several um, recurring critiques that have been raised since the publication of our paper, uh, that uh, uh, most of which we have addressed, I believe, uh, but uh, but there are still quite uh, quite a bit of uh, remaining uh, challenges ahead of us, and we're actively pursuing this line of work as well, along along with others. Now let's look at the model. So the, the investment cap, cap M is um, what I call the investment cap M is a reformulation from the newer classical Q theory of investment. Uh, it's the same math, okay? Uh, same, it's a mathematical restatement of investment oil equation. So in, in this dimension, the reformulation is fairly analogous as the reformulation from the permanent income theory of consumption to the consumption cap M, right? And there you are looking at consumption oil equation, right? You fixing returns, look at the consumption behavior endogenously, that's permanent income theory of consumption. Um, Friedman, um, Franco Modigliani, and those early um, contributors in that literature, right? So you take returns, oftentimes just interest rates in, uh, in, the, in, in the early literature, and then you endogenize consumption. And later on, Rubinstein, Lucas, and Breeden came along and said, look at the same equation, right? EMR, conditional expectation of pricing kernel times return equals one. Now we're gonna take consumption as given, right? So it can take the endowment economy, take consumption as given. Now let's look at um, what the returns are gonna be endogenously. Right, so it's a reformulation, the same equation. Uh, in an analogous sense, we have been doing something similar, but based on the partial equilibrium investment literature. And keep in mind that, that the consumption, the permanent income theory, um, consumption literature is also partial equilibrium in the sense that you take a firm's behavior as given is not literally arrow de brew general equilibrium uh, apply the equilibrium setup uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, we taught, uh, that we were taught when growing up, study study masculine wisdom green, for example. All right, so so 
So let's see how we reformulate the newer classical Q theory of investment uh, into an asset pricing theory, right? So partial equilibrium. So firms are going to have, I'm going to analyze the individual firm's problem, operating profits given by this pi function. Uh, uh, K, pi is operating profits. K is capital. Uh, this is the first step at this, you know, relatively new way of doing asset pricing. So, so K is, uh, it's, uh, is so, excuse me, we're just going to start with the physical capital. Okay, so uh, tangible investment and uh, just just as a starting point, uh, XT is a vector of shocks could be aggregate shocks, industry shocks and firm specific shocks. But when we're not going to do a fully specified um, calibration simulation uh, study, when we're, we're, we're going to measure XT uh, indirectly, we're going to use limited information. Um, uh, uh, GMM tests. Okay, so so I'm a big fan of Hanson Singleton uh, line of work, and GMM is one of the you know in my view one of the uh, best um, empirical methodologies out there that gives us um, a way to take a structural model to the data, so we get the best of both worlds, both theory and empirical uh, data. We get to match theory and data carefully, and that takes a bit of uh, imagination and uh, creativity. All right, so so operating profits, we're gonna we're gonna parameterize uh, using uh, we're gonna use Copdoculus implicitly in the back of our minds. We're gonna be uh, parameterizing uh, marginal product of capital as proportional to sales to capital. All right, this is a fairly standard uh, uh, functional form um, uh, specification that has been made. Uh, in the in the in the in the investment literature in macroeconomics and the corporate finance, so capital evolves as although there are probably some ways to explore and using earnings, you know, earnings has been receiving a ton of beatings recently for expensing away intangibles. So, but probably cash flow. If you use cash flow, you are losing um, some accrual matching. Uh, right, so uh, it's not exactly the cash flow you receive. It is not exactly um, the, the, the the economic profits you make this period. So that's why we need the matching principle uh, with the accrual accounting. But nevertheless, that's something on our mind. We haven't tried. We haven't experimented extensively so far. But there's something uh, that we will explore going forward. Bottom line is that this is this parameterization is the simplest way possible and that seems seems to be a natural uh, place to start and capital accumulation next period capital equals current period capital net of depreciation delta is the rate of depreciation and the plus capex all right so this is a this is investment capital expenditure um i'll talk about the measurement later on so convex adjustment costs so again the simplest uh, functional form possible. We actually started with a, a more general form using a quadrat quadratic and even maybe even fourth order. And later on, we'll find that higher order terms uh, contribute relatively little to our overall empirical performance. So we just, um, you know, simplify ruthlessly and just stick with uh, quadratic. So uh, um, we're going to we're going to take the model to match with data all right so um um so we need to model leverage uh, because without the leverage investment return would be like asset return right so it would be not totally uh accurate to match asset return with the equity return right so this is not um, uh, like a q factor paper uh, in the q factor paper we only used the investment capm framework for directional predictions right and then we right but the, in this paper we are doing structural estimation we are take we are taking the model structure seriously right we we're, we're, we're using gmm to evaluate to estimate structural parameters uh, ideally 
right? So uh, I'm I'm not saying the execution is perfect or not at all. So later on, uh, you're gonna see me um, pointing out the one weakness of one after another. Uh, so so, but this is only a first step. But in, in our view, a reasonably important step at that. Um, all right. So so we're gonna we're gonna model leverage. We're gonna follow Hennessy and Whited, 2005, 2007. Uh, uh, in using, we start with the one period that, okay? And that's something that uh, has always been on, on our mind. So far, we haven't made any headway. So, you know, um, if any, you know, smarter people uh, working in uh, dynamic corporate finance and who can um, extend our model using multi-period debt, inf even infinite horizon debt, and then at the same time, still maintain the analytical um, equation for the weighted average cost of capital, and that seem, that will be an important, uh, in my view, that will be an important theoretical uh, extension. And uh, you know, so at uh, okay, I'll 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 get there when I get there. I'll, I'll describe the weighted average cost of capital equation. All right. So the payout is basically defined in a fairly standard way. So so pro operating profits minus adjustment costs. So we are expensing away adjustment costs, right? So that's tax deduct deductible. Tau is tax rate, corporate tax rate. So to keep it simple, we are not making it the firm specific. Although in the, in the appendix, we did follow Graham 96, 1996 article to make it the firm specific. Uh, that the, the results we report are fairly, fairly, fairly quantitatively similar. So we're going to stick with the time invariant tax rate. So we're going to take away capex uh, investment one period debt. You're going to have inflow from issuing one period debt, but cash outflow from repaying old debt, and then depreciation tax shield, right? Depreciation that's part of the expense. And you can use that to detect tax. Uh, that's the tax shield out of depreciation. And finally, you also have interest expense tax shield. So RB is a pre-tax gross uh, interest rate or bond return. So minus one, this will be the interest expense uh, times um, amount of debt. All right, this will be interest expense. And then and you use that to save some of your uh, tax payment. So the last term is interest uh, sh tax shield. All right. So the firm's objective function is fairly standard. You maximize market value of equity, and M is the pricing kernel. Dividends is basically net payouts. All right. And V is cum dividend firm value. So, uh, all right. So um, the investment oil equation uh, is pretty well known from prior investment literature. So, and you can rewrite the investment oil equation in this functional form that says conditional expectation of pricing kernel times uh, what Cochrane 1991 article calls the investment return equals one. So this investment return is a technological concept, not the financial return concept. Right, specifically the investment return is the marginal benefit of investment next period divided by marginal cost of investment today. Right, so look at the marginal cost of investment. You have marginal purchasing cost, which is the numerator. The price of uh, uh, capital goods is normalized to be one. So that's the mar marginal purchasing cost. And then because we're using quadratic adjustment cost. So A times I over K, A, A times investment rate, this is the marginal adjustment cost, all right? It's linear. And then the adjustment cost can be used to um, uh, deduct tax, subtract tax, taxable income. So you need, to, you need to calculate the after tax. So marginal cost, marginal adjustment cost. Bottom line is that the denominator is the marginal uh, total cost of investment at time T after the firm pays that amount of marginal cost, at the beginning of next period, you're gonna have one extra unit of capital. You use that extra unit of capital to produce, to generate the marginal product of capital, given as this you know, proportional to sales to capital. And then you also, because quadratic adjustment cost, 
you take the derivative of this phi function, which is adjustment cost vis a v capital, you're going to get a negative sign. So the firm is bigger, it's going to be relatively easier for the firm to adjust a given amount of capital. So you're going to get some marginal benefit in the form of marginal reduction of adjustment cost going forward. And that's given by this term right there. All right. So both both marginal product and the marginal reduction in adjustment costs have to be taken away uh, taxes. Okay, so this is a net of taxes given right here. So, and then you also have marginal uh, tax shield, right, as part of the overall marginal benefit of investment because you have one extra unit of capital at the beginning of next period over the course of next period, and that's going to deliver you know, depreciation rate as the amount of depreciation and that you can use that to save your tax uh, payment. Uh, that's the delta times uh, tau uh, quantifies uh, that depreciation, marginal depreciation tax shield. And finally, uh, finally, net of depreciation, your one extra unit of capital is going to be left with one minus delta uh, units of capital. And that extra amount of capital is going to be worth marginal Q, which is a, which marginal Q is the present value of all future marginal benefits for over all future periods, right? And it's an infinite uh, sum formulation for marginal Q, but you can use the uh, first principle of investment that marginal Q data T plus one is going to be equal to exactly marginal cost of investment at time T plus one. In other words, the denominator marginal cost of investment at time t is actually marginal Q at time t as well, right? So all the all the derivations are in the appendix and the, uh, the economics underlying the model at this point of the literature uh, is fairly well established. All right, so and that will be the expected continuation value. Bottom line is that it's a trade-off Investment return is a trade-off between marginal benefit of investment next period divided by marginal cost of investment in the current period, All right? And you and you, you discount that using the pricing kernel. That's gonna uh, among collapse to one amounts to one. All right. So um, on the debt dimension, you have uh, you have after tax. So if you define after tax bond return or risky interest rate as this is the pre-tax interest rate, uh, take away some of the tax benefit. And then it turns out if you discount the after tax interest rate, you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna add up to one again. All right. And stock return is defined in the conventional way and in which P is X dividend from value, while as V, as noted before, is cum dividend from value. Under constant return to scale, and you can prove that the investment return, this technological trade-off between benefit next period and uh, cost in the current period, that the investment return is going to be equal to the weighted average a cost of capital, in other words, the weighted average of the stock return and the after-tax bond return. All right. So, um, so in Modigliani Miller, um, 1958, the Proposition Three, for example, and that's the first place. And I need to read the literature a little bit more carefully. So, but in, based on my current reading, that seems to be the first article that talks about the weighted average cost of capital approach to capital budgeting. Uh, they, uh, Modigliani Miller, use rho, the notation rho, to denote the hurdle rate. All right. They say, all right, the hurdle rate. Uh, it's going to be equal to uh, you have to keep investing until the weighted cost of capital is going to equal to the hurdle rate. Uh, but the, what the, the 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 newer classical uh, Q theory can can add to the picture is that you can endogenize effectively. We have endogenized the hurdle rate in uh, uh, Modigliani Miller uh, proposition three using the real economy using the technology. All right. So bottom line is that if you stare at that equation, investment return equals weighted average cost of capital, and you go back to this equation, right? You have weighted average cost of capital in the left-hand side. In the right-hand side, you're going to have marginal benefit 
divided by marginal cost. And that's exactly the weighted average cost of capital approach to capital budgeting, which says that firms will keep investing, keep taking positive MPV projects until for the last project, which is the marginal cost of investment, the cost of taking the marginal uh, project, the infinitesimally small project, the marginal uh, cost of investment equal the marginal benefit out of the last project you take divided by the weighted average cost of capital. In other words, marginal, the, your investment cost for the last project you take is going to be exactly equal the present value of that project you take. All right, the present value is again the marginal benefit of that project divided by the weighted average cost of capital. So this is exactly uh, the weighted average cost of capital approach to capital budgeting, which is not controversial at all. And we teach the work. Uh, we teach the WAC approach to capital budgeting in our, in our MBA classrooms or masters in finance classroom for decades, right? So what we're going to do is that after endogenized the hurdle rate in Modigliani Miller proposition three, we're gonna turn the WAC equation of capital budgeting around as asset pricing theory. Uh, we say, look, stock return gonna be equal to lever. Basically we solve for stock return from this identity, from this equation, we get stock return equals levered investment return, which is given uh, by this functional form. And if you look at this functional form, W is market leverage, is data. After tax bond return, that's data, right? You can measure with real data and look, and then and then look at the investment return. We have two parameter, two structural parameters. So one is the curvature in the production function alpha. The other one is the adjustment cost parameter. The model is fairly parsimonious, right? And all the rest can be measured with real data at the firm level, compute that. Sales to capital, uh, investment to capital, investment rate, and delta, the rates of depreciation, we can all measure with data. Data, we can debate how, how high the quality, the available data are, but we can, we can, we can, we can at least get the, get the, get the ball rolling and get the show started. All right. So we can, we get to implement the model in closed form. We have lots of real data. This real con this contact with real data is always a good thing, uh, in my, in my, in my view. All right. Now let's look at the econometric methods to see how we take this formulation to the data. So let me mention one thing. This formulation is in effect a weighted average cost of capital approach to capital budgeting. This is a first order condition. This is a first principle, right? It's not accounting identity. It's an optimization condition. It's a first principle. It's the NPV rule in capital budgeting, right? It's, a, it's as fundamental as fundamental as diversification for a mean variance investor, uh, for example, in particular, right? Based on which sharp Lindner derived the classic cap. All right, now let's see how we take the model to the data. So we're gonna we're gonna take we're gonna test the the implication that expected stock returns equal expected levers to investment return, and that's the moment condition. So so in theory, this equation. Right, stock return equals level the investment return or weighted average cost of capital equals investment return. So that equation holds period by period and state by state, right? In Poporian, Karl Popper terminology and that prediction is extremely falsifiable, right? So any one observation, you can reject that. So on the other hand, there's not that inconceivable to say, let's say marginal product of capital has some measurement errors, all right? So in, instead of just proportional to sales capital, so maybe some measurement errors with mean zero enter uh, the numerator, right? In an additive form, right? And then we have some measurement errors and then the, um, the, the equation will not be holding exactly, but on average, it, uh, the equation will hold. Right. So, and that's what uh, I should mention that uh, uh, in general, measurement errors and the specification errors. Who says 
Um, adjustment cost needs to be quadratic. Doesn't have to be, right? Although we did do extensive testing, we find that higher order terms don't add up, don't contribute much much in terms of empirical performance, uh, but still, so maybe there are some other, uh, later on we added working capital and you can make uh, argument, maybe some intangible capital, maybe labor, there are all kinds of misspecification errors. And I should acknowledge that misspecification errors, unlike forecasting errors, right? When we do GMM, we invoke rational expectations assumption, we say forecasting errors are not forecastable, and then this way we get to use in instruments, right? And to scale the moment conditions up. Uh, but, um, but, um, but we are conscientious that the specification errors, the potential errors in our equation are potentially uh, measurement errors are relatively easier to deal with, but specific er specification errors are not. Okay, so we're not gonna say spe misspecification errors are not correlated with the um, uh, uh, um, variable stated time t. We're not going to do any conditioning. We're just going to do the unconditional uh, first moment test given by this functional form. And uh, given by this moment condition, as noted, this moment condition is relatively immune to mean zero measurement errors. Okay. And on top of that, um, when people talk about anomalies in the cross section of returns, they mean the cross section of average returns, the cross section of expected returns. And that's exactly what we are zeroing on. That, that's exactly what we're focusing on. We're focusing on expected returns, all right? So, and the, in this paper, we also uh, estimate, in addition to estimate the expected return moments only, we also estimate the expected returns jointly with the variance returns, uh, variance moment conditions. So given by given given by this equation, we're saying, all right, let's look at whether whether second moments uh, between stock and the levered investment returns are lining up as well. You can keep going. You can test uh, uh, third moment skewness, ketosis, or whatnot, and some percentile, uh, some crash probability, tail probability. You can do all that. Uh, but uh, but we uh, later on. Um, in our subsequent work, we have indeed looked at uh, some higher, um, more exotic moments, but, uh, but our focus has always been on the cross-section of expected returns. That's what the anomalies literature is mostly about, in the cross-section. Now, I agree, Schiller's excess volatility puzzle at the aggregate level is a big deal, but, uh, but our focus is on the cross-section. All right, okay. Again, the impact of measurement errors is important on the me. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's important on the volatility, but it's largely gets averaged away on the first moment. All right, testing portfolios. We're gonna be implementing the um, the the moment condition on testing portfolios. Uh, we selected the three sets of testing portfolios. The granddaddy of all anomalies, uh, uh, termed by Pharma, Pharma 1998 uh, GAV article. So uh, standardized unexpected earnings, first documented by Brown Brown, extremely um, influential uh, body of work uh, that I have a world of respect for. I've been learning, uh, I've been consuming accounting literature like Evidently, uh, really a big fan. So I, I think uh, I think um, I think uh, take the model, economic model, to the data needs a lot a lot more careful measurement in the exist existing literature. And um, uh, and the co my co-authors and I are working hard to mitigate that weakness in our body of literature. All right. So we use uh, standardized unexpected earnings. The measurement follows change of conditional account shock. Uh, book to market, this is the value uh, premium. And as noted earlier, corporate investment that's all from uh, the influential work of Titman Wei and Shea paper. And I should uh, comment on the um, estimation strategy. So why we focus on portfolios? Well, the first is from, uh, um, right? So the, the 1972 article, that first Jensen shows um, 
1972 article. Uh, while the detailed reference is in the paper, uh, is cited in our paper, I'm relying on my memory uh, for specific references. I'm relying on my memory, which is not reliable. Uh, I will be the first one to admit that. So, um, um, uh, back in the dinosaur age, when we used to go to office, uh, oftentimes, um, you know, I have trouble remembering uh, which floor on the um, on the garage I parked my car. So that says something about my memory. All right. So so why portfolios? One is the uh, the in Imperial Asset Pricing we routinely do a portfolio approach. So I'm a big fan of portfolio approach because uh, because especially relative to individual stocks. So we have larger and more reliable expect return spreads across portfolios, right? So you diversify, you sort stocks into portfolios, you diversify quite a bit of idiosyncratic volatility, you shrink your standard errors, the high minus low returns become more significant. Whereas if you deal with individual stocks, right, it's quite a bit noisy, although you have probably more cross-sectional observations, uh, but uh, but you know in, in our experience uh, portfolio approach has always uh, served us well so that's um, uh, a surprising reason there's also an important uh, uh, macroeconomic reason it's um, um, due to my esteemed Ohio State colleague uh, Julia Thomas as well as Opi Kang and the Kang and Thomas paper and Thomas 2002 uh, at paper at the Journal of Political Economy so borderline is that so although at the establishment micro level, investment behavior is very lumpy, uh, but uh, once you aggregate into aggregate level, uh, the lumpiness, impact of lumpiness, lumpiness pretty much goes away. Now to model lumpy investment, you, think, you need things like fixed cost of investment. You know, you need all kinds of, uh, um, uh, you know, asymmetry uh, to model things carefully. Right, so now, now to take the take the investment model to the data through GMM, we started with the simplest model possible, which is quadratic. Back then, our thinking is that, well, let's just use you know the portfolio level estimation, All right? Portfolio level estimation, we are hoping some of the uh, the portfolio aggregation step can smooth away some of the firm level uh, lumpiness. Um, that may that that gives the model a chance. Now, in our subsequent work, we have indeed uh, explored, uh, experimented alternative aggregation, and uh, achieve actually achieved better empirical performance, and which I will uh, present in a future future video. Now, timing alignment. Whew. Oh no! All right, I need a drink before explaining this figure. As a first step in, as a first step in implementing this model, we only included firms with December physical year end in our sample. Later on, we relax that assumption in subsequent work. Also, all right, take a book to market decimals. We are following the annual sorting in Pharma French in 1993 and 96 and many other papers. Uh, right in June end of year T, we sold stocks into 10 book to market decimals based on book to market from the last physical year end. And then we hold monthly returns from July of year T to June of T plus one. All right. And that's where the uh, decimal testing portfolio return runs from July of year T to June of T plus one. And so are the bond returns. All right now. Now, now let, let's look at how we construct the investment returns. Now in the model, the stock variables are measured at the beginning of the per period, take a period T, right? So KIT capital is measured at the beginning of period T. Well, as investment, the flow variable occurs during the course of period T, that's the model. Although investment is known when firms make decision at the beginning of time T, but the invest, investment expenditure occurs during the course of the year. All right. Well, as in CompuStat, 
right? Both the stock variable and the flow variable are recorded at the end of fiscal year, okay? At the end of the period T in a sense of speaking, right? So in that regard, so let's say for 2020, for fiscal year 2020, Apple computer, for example. So we take uh, investment at for year 2020 from 2020 uh, uh, financial statement, but we take capital from, from one year prior 2019 balance sheet, right? Because that's measured at the beginning of the period. Right, so, and the T plus one variables are basically one year uh, later, one, one year forward, one year ahead, right? So T plus, uh, capital T plus one is measured at the beginning of the year uh, 2021 and uh, or the end of, you know, the, basically the, the balance sheet from 2020. Well, as we had that, we have to wait until 2021 comes to a close and firms announce um, you know, reported um, 10K, and uh, and then we can we can read out their flow variables, so depreciation expenses, sales, and uh, and the investment, right? So once you take put the put the, all the accounting information, plug all the accounting items values into the nonlinear investment return, right? We say okay, roughly it goes from the middle of year T to the middle of year T plus one. And that's our investment return timing. We say, we're not gonna say it is perfect, not perfect at all. Um, welcome to empirical work. So um, you don't get to assume things. You have to match things carefully. So investment return uh, is, we're gonna say investment return roughly goes from the middle of year T to the middle of year T plus one, you know, way in lines up nicely with the pharma French timing uh, for portfolio sorts. All right, and that's for annually sorted uh, corporate investment and value book to market decimals. But for SUE, uh, things are a bit more involved because um, uh, earnings momentum, SUE um, decimals are monthly formed. So in this paper, again, the first effort in this line of work, we basically implemented the annual sorts. All right, in the time series, we only have annual, We compressed into annual observations. Later on, we relax into monthly. But for this paper, uh, we time aggregate the uh, uh, monthly SUE decile returns from July of year T to June of year T plus one. We time aggregate these 12 monthly returns into annual returns. And then um, for each month, uh, we figure out um, the, 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 um, the physical year T and T plus one, uh, firm characteristics, and then we time aggregate, we not time aggregate, we simply aggregate, yeah, time aggregate. No. We simply aggregate over time. So different characteristics over the SUE, let's say SUE loser decile uh, for each of the month. Okay, and we take, we take that as the um, accounting variable of Characteristics for that decile, and then we form the, and then we form the, uh, we form the investment return for the SUE loser decile that way. All right, the details are in the paper. Uh, although later on we 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 come up with a more, uh, in our view, more polished timing alignment procedure, uh, especially for the for the for the SUE at uh, the monthly sorted the portfolios. Um, all right. Okay, let me move ahead. So measurement also uh, uh, <laughs> that we have revised quite a bit and this is the first step. Um, uh, this first step we use gross PPNE, um, right? And simply as a scalar. Uh, later on, I will explain uh, in a future presentation that our thinking has evolved that in our view, only net PPE should be used to measure capital. But for now, we are using gross PPE in this paper. So investment later on, we have our thinking has evolved as well. So uh, using, we, we are backing out, uh, later on, we're backing out the investment from the balance sheet, change in PPE and T. Uh, and accounting depreciation. But for now, we are using uh, cash flow uh, statement that's CapEx minus sales of PB&E. 
uh, why is basically sales and debt is long term plus short term debt, right? Fairly standard in corporate. Um, equity is market equity. Uh, delta is basically amount of uh, depreciation divided by gross PPE and um, and the bond return. So not the uh, because our focus is on the cross section of equity returns. Uh, but the, the bond, the sample with the corporate bond returns is much smaller uh, relative to uh, the, the broader cross-sectional equity return sample, all right? And therefore we implement a procedure um, that we learned from Bloomling and McKinley. Uh, in other words, we're gonna be imputing bond ratings. We're gonna fit using sample firms with bond ratings data, we fit the, uh, um, um, uh, logic model of credit ratings on, on, on firm characteristics, a list of firm characteristics. And then uh, we're gonna, we're gonna take, the, take the fitted component and we're gonna impute the credit ratings on firms that do not have credit ratings, right? And then we're gonna, we're gonna assign bond ratings for that credit rating from Ibis Associates to all the firms. Uh, in our sample that have the same ratings. Okay, so that's different the imputation procedure and later on we, we evolved away from this procedure also. But the bottom line is that this is the first step and uh, the bond rate, the cross section of bond returns, it's uh, the economic magnitude is much smaller than the cross section of equity return. So this step, it's not essential, um, all right? So I don't think it's quantitatively um, uh, that important. Then finally, tau is the corporate uh, tax rate. All right, so let's look at the um, estimation results matching expected stock returns. So uh, we are implementing separate, okay? And later on, critics quickly point out your parameter values are varying and which, which we uh, took a look and said, right, you're right. Uh, and then we confirm that in a subsequent study. All right, so, but for now we are estimating the model uh, separately for, for SUE, book to market and corporate investment. So as you can see, so A parameters, they do vary. Okay. Ideally, if this, if the model is truly structural, these are technological parameters, so, right, and, uh, and uh, they should not vary across portfolios, but I've learned enough about the empirical work and not to take, um, you know, structural ideal literally. It's a way of, I'm a big fan of structural estimation, uh, but on the other hand, I'm quite realistic uh, about the empirical work in the sense that, you know, I have, developed over the years some appreciation about the messiness of the data. We do the best we, we can, right? And uh, we keep an open mind that we, 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 we try to be humble uh, about, uh, about our work. And uh, we always have our ears open and any suggestions, we can do our job better and we are, we are all ears. So, and we, 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 we are here to learn and to explore and to seek the truth, um, however defined, hopefully based on some internal criteria and logic. So, um, all right, scientific realist. I'm a scientific realist. So, sorry, I've digressed again. I've been studying philosophy of science. I've been having a lot of fun. Scientific realism says that there exists truth that our work is approximating the truth, gradually getting closer to truth, but that's not without the uh, controversy in philosophy. All right, okay, back to back to um, back to asset pricing. All right, so alpha is the capital share, uh, well, curvature. So it's um, 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 so it's between zero and one, although it varies a bit. So you see, book to market, the standard errors are kind of high. So um, although, although, you know, at least separately, the model fits pretty well. So I'm not gonna make a huge deal about the p-values, okay? Um, I don't think it's a good thing. 
uh, p value, we cannot reject the model, but on the other hand, we, we, we are doing annual estimation, although we do have some cross section. So we, we have annual observation, we don't have a whole lot of annual observation. Later on, once we switch to monthly uh, estimation, the p values will be below 5%. That indicates power, we, in which we are happy about. So mean uh, pricing error, this is across the portfolio. So that I want to emphasize. Economic magnitude of the errors, model errors, or alphas, okay, if you allow me. So to call model errors alphas. So, all right, so the, 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 model, the model errors are actually small, right? And we saw the, we saw the scatter plots early on, the errors are small, uh, not very big. Right, so, um, and the, yeah. All right, I don't want to be defensive about it. Uh, borderline is that uh, the first step at uh, explaining anomalies, post earnings announcement drift, granddaddy of all anomaly and value more anomaly and the investment anomaly. Again, the, the first implementation is by no means perfect. Uh, lots of issues and we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are working hard to address them. We have adjusted some of them, but there are more, more, more things left, right? So on the other hand, we can actually find using GMN, we can actually find plausible parameter values that the model actually fits. The same cannot be said about traditional asset pricing models. That's why we call these things anomalies. They are anomalies because they cannot be explained by the consumption cap M in which the cap M is a special case. Okay. Again, I don't want to be defensive about it. I just want to, I just wish to uh, point it out. All right. So in turn, um, in case of Euler equation errors and look at the SUE deciles. So, and that's the cap M alpha. And we saw from the scatter plus the high minus slow alpha is immense, right? It's basically flat. And from a French three factor alpha is also, uh, you know, large, right? So it's fairly close to average return in the data consumption cap M as well. And, uh, and uh, although, you know, consumption cap M is probably right. I mean, the, the, the implementation uh, is also the test design. It also leaves some, the power of the test also leaves something to be desired, right? So it's insignificant despite the large economic magnitude for the alpha, but they look at that Q, Q, um, our investment cap M alpha or model error, and that's really small. So 0.4%, uh, this is per month, okay? This is really small. So book to market deciles, cap M alpha from a French alpha and consumption cap M alpha, these are all economically large and significant, economically large for consumption uh, cap M, but again, the power is not, you know, not that strong. So we don't reject the statistically, but economic magnitude of the alpha is big. Again, look at the investment uh, model error, the investment cap M alpha is only 1.21%, right? So this is small, right? And insignificant. So finally, corporate investment deciles, so again, cap M alpha from a French alpha, consumption cap M alpha uh, relatively large, whilst the investment cap M alpha is small, right? 0.5% uh, per year. This is, this is, this is, you know, um, again, uh, our, our econometric work adds uh, many flaws, right? And we are free to accept those and working hard to address, but relatively speaking, vis-a-vis -vis what we have in the field, the, you know, the traditional asset pricing models, we view our paper as an important step going forward, uh, especially laying down how, um, how, how to do asset pricing, how to do cross-sectional asset pricing uh, from, the, from the supply side. So, and we view this paper um, as an important contribution. I mean, in, 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 in my opinion, at least. All right, so expect return uh, determinants. So I'm not gonna make a big deal about the causality. So all these are endogenous variables, just like consumption betas, 
All right, so there's no causality flowing from consumption betas to expect returns either. Although if you read the Sharp, Littner, Kepm, the original articles, they put the variance covariance matrix as given, right? That's exogenous. It appears like Kepm beta is exogenous, but that's a modeling choice. In equilibrium, these things are endogenous. These are endogenous variables. So it's hard to uh, claim causality, although let me be careful. I um, just recently started digging the uh, philosophical literature on causality. So because both consumption cap M and the investment model, investment gap M, we have some model. There may be something to be said about causality, but at this point, I just don't know. All right, so, so I'm gonna take the conservative approach. I'm gonna say at, at this point, no causality um, as the most of the suppression literature, uh, which is try, which tries to avoid causal uh, inferences. We're gonna say these are uh, correlations out of equilibrium based on first order conditions, right? So out of the first order conditions, you see that just like consumption betas, only consumption betas on the on the on the in the consumption cap M framework in the investment model is all uh, char characteristics. Right. If you look at the investment model, we have sales to sales to capital, uh, investment to capital, depreciation, and then the levered version. You have you have market leverage as well, right? And bond return. Let's ignore that. The spread is small relative to the the, the equity return spread. So for the SUE portfolios, what we reported here is the average characteristics for the for the SUE decels. So the, the four blown decimal results are in the, in the appendix, uh, in the printed version in the journals, uh, you know, we are told to um, simplify, right? So we only reported the low five and high decimal as well as high minus low. Basically high minus low SUE decimal doesn't differ much in terms of investment rate, but differs quite a bit in terms of investment growth Actually, the growth of, of investment to capital ratio, which is right here. So uh, there's actually the growth rate of marginal Q. This is marginal Q in the current period, and that's marginal Q in the next period. Uh, but because Q involves uh, ob unobservable structural parameter, so we just went ahead and did the invest the growth rate of investment to capital ratio, because we're aggregating everything into portfolio level. Investment is always positive, so we don't worry about the negative investment uh, in the denominator. So uh, investment to capital growth uh, is is has a large spread across. In other words, the expected growth component is important for SUE. Profitability as well, sales to capital. Depreciation, not a big deal. Uh, market leverage goes slightly the wrong way. And then basically the bond return spread is tiny. Right, so the comparative statics. So on this slide, what we did is that Take, uh, take the first row, for example, I over K bar. What, what we did is that we take the structural parameters, point estimates from our benchmark estimation. And then we say, uh, then we say for each portfolio, we're gonna set the portfolio level I over K investment rate to be the cross-sectional average, to be the cross-sectional mean. Right, so this way we eliminate, we, we so we eliminate all the cross-sectional deviation in investment rate from all the SUE portfolios. So if we do that, and then we plug in, we plug this cross-sectional mean, cross-sectional average investment to uh, capital ratio back into our investment return equation. And then we recalculate all the pricing errors, in particular high minus low uh, pricing, uh, the investment cap M alpha. If that alpha is big, as a result of this removing cross-sectional deviation, then we say, hey, that deviation in that variable is really important, right? In driving the SUE uh, expect return dispersion, right? So that's the basic idea. It turns out I over K is not that important for SUE anomaly, as you can see, removing I over K cross-sectional dispersion deviation 
of variation, the alpha resulting alpha is only slightly bigger uh, than, than the benchmark uh, alpha, which is about 0.4%. Whereas the most important component is uh, the Q growth rate. As noted earlier, in the characteristic table, we only reported the, the growth rate of I, of I over K, uh, although in the actual investment return is the growth rate of marginal Q that enters the picture. But that involves adjustment cost, which is okay, but we know the adjustment cost uh, in the benchmark estimation. So what we did is that we fix, we remove all the cross-sectional uh, variation in the growth rate of marginal Q and then see what happens to the alpha and plug everything, all the characteristics into the investment return equation and then calculate the investment alpha. And then we get that 8.9%, which is the biggest out of all the experiments we did. And then we say that's important. Okay, we say the expected growth component is the most important component. Uh, quote unquote determinant, again, no causality is claimed. I just say expect return component uh, for, for, for the SUE portfolio. Y over K dispersion in the cross-section is also important. Without that cross-sectional dispersion, you get the 4.3% alpha for the investment model. So expected growth component is the most important. And the second most important is profitability. Now let's look at the book to market decile. Uh, you see investment rate is it's clearly a dispersion, significant uh, value invests less than growth on average. The growth rate on the other hand is you know, very small and insignificant, 0 0.04. Growth value firms are less profitable than growth firms. You know, the evidence is fairly consistent with Pharma French, 1995. So, Well, you have no idea how familiar I am with the Pharma French papers. So, <laughs> all right, I thought that was funny. Anyway, so the rate of uh, depreciation, the rate of depreciation is it's it's non-existent. Also, so market leverage value stocks are more levered, have higher market leverage ratios than growth stocks, and that dispersion is significant. And finally, and the, the bond return is, you know, there's something there, but uh, not the big deal. So in terms of comparative statics, it turns out that the investment rate is the most important component, quote unquote, determinant of the value premium, right? And fairly consistent with our later on the Q factor uh, paper result that controlling for the investment factor and value factor uh, is redundant. All right, value premium is shrinks to practically zero, right? You see, we see the same thing uh, in the structural estimation, removing the cross-sectional variation in the investment rate. Our investment alpha uh, jumps up to 90, 90% 90 per year. So this in a way is reflects our uh, adjustment cost parameter being, being 22, being relatively high for this set of decimals um, that, you know, and something it's, problematic in our empirical design. And that's okay, it took us more than 10 years to uh, figure that one out, but we have figured that one out. The expected growth is the exact aggregation and working capital investment that I will, I will get to in a future uh, presentation. So the growth rate of marginal Q uh, is not that important, right? It's, uh, it's only the alpha only jumps up to uh, Two slight only slightly higher than the benchmark uh, error bench benchmark alpha uh, profitability not the big deal either relative to especially relative to investment leverage matters somewhat but not nearly as important as investment bottom line is that investment is the most important determinant for the value premium so corporate investment uh, characteristics. We see that not surprisingly, uh, actually probably surprisingly, right, high minus low value premium only 10% difference. For corporate investment, uh, slightly lower 7%. Again, it's because as noted earlier, the treatment weigh and shear 
investment uh, measure actually is a combination of uh, capex and sales. So actually sales enter the picture. So it's not literally a sword on investment rate per se. Right, so um, investment growth shows up, right? Let's look at comparative statics. Uh, it turns out in, uh, still investment dispersion is the most important component driving the corporate investment uh, average return spread. So the error gets to 8.5%. Uh, marginal Q growth matters a little bit as well, but not as important as I over K spread. All right, so um, the next segment, I'm going to describe the joint estimation of memes and the volatility. So, um, so these are the point estimates. You know, they they are quite a bit different from estimating the means only. Um, again, um, uh, the results are reported, though I, you know, uh, I, 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 tend, I tend to tell myself and this set of estimation results and are literally impacted by measurement errors, even with zero, even with zero means, okay? And the measurement errors, well, 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 can well uh, muddy the water in a sense of speaking. So this chi one test, chi square test denoted one is all the mean uh, moment conditions for the mean, right? So the p value again, I'm not gonna make a big deal out of it. They are not rejected, uh, not not rejected. Although the variance, yeah, while well, they are not rejected either. Okay. So now let's look at the moments. Basically, once the model is forced to match the mean and the volatility simultaneously, it matches the volatility, especially in terms of level, although it counterfactually predicts some spread, although in the data, some spread between low and high, although not that conspicuous, but in the data is virtually, is virtually completely absent. However, it gives up on the mean the fit on the expected returns. Now it becoming a horizontal cloud, all right? So, so, so this is the SUE decimals for book to market. Now we are well, roughly matching the mean for volatility, but we counterfactually predicting a spread over high and the low. And although on the mean, on the average return side, uh, we're doing better. Uh, we retain some of the value premium as predicted in the model. For corporate investment deciles, um, the volatilities moments are again fitted reasonably fine, uh, but the uh, expected returns were giving up uh, in terms of uh, high minus low in the model is virtually zero. Bottom line is that the model failed to match the mean and the variance simultaneously. Okay, I'll leave it. At, at that, but on the other hand, I keep reminding myself at least uh, how well do I allocate my research time, right? So and and I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take priority on other important issues rather than matching the variance per se uh, from the structural estimation because in the back of my mind, I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying there are more important things that uh, that. Uh, that, that, that I need to worry about. So in the back of my mind, I always view the, the, the variance moment conditions as confounded with measurement errors, unknown measurement errors and unknown specification errors. But it's something to, to think about, maybe worthwhile doing going forward, worthwhile addressing. It's just so far we haven't had the time uh, to get around. To that, and in the online appendix, we reported a long list of a uh, uh, long list of um, uh, robust checks. We executed the second stage GMN. Uh, the results are fairly similar because uh, because the, the the volatilities do not differ much, do not co very much with the uh, characteristics. So even if you use the um, um, a variance covariance matrix to reconstruct the weights as opposed to identity matrix uh, in Cochrane 1996. We follow 
uh, Jones recommendation using identity matrix in the first stage. So even we, we do the second stage and turns out the results are, the point estimates are fairly, are, fairly, are fairly similar and because the volatilities are roughly comparable. So that's not a big deal. We also try the market value of that measure as in Bernanke and, and Campbell 1988 as opposed to book value of that. The results are quite similar. Value weighted returns, the results I would say largely quantitatively similar but the overperformance of the investment model is not as dramatic as the equal weighted uh, returns because the anomaly, the, the, the hurdle is lower, right? So it doesn't look like, um, you know, uh, right? The hurdle is lower for all the models, uh, even though the investment model managed to match the expect return, uh, match the equal weighted return as well as value return, but uh, the relative performance uh, between the investment model and other uh, traditional models is not as um, as big as in the value weighted returns as in equal weighted returns. Try the alternative window length, uh, capital as PBENT, cap and investment as CAPEX, time invariant as well as firm specific corporate tax rates as in uh, John Grant's 1996 measurement. And all the results are, um, are uh, are robust and that they are detailed in the internet appendix. Now, let me get to um, criticisms of our work that have been raised since the publication of our study more than 10 years ago. So the first critique is extremely fair and we acknowledge um, pretty much right away and, uh, and has taken us 10 years to fix this issue the first of all, as noted earlier, the A parameter, adjustment cost parameter and the curvature parameter in the production technology, the estimates vary with testing portfolios, right? If the model is truly structural, if the model is uh, very well specified and all these things should be rather stable. Uh, if the, if, uh, but the, or equivalently, we need the different parameter values to fit post earnings announcement drift as the parameters, we need to fit the value. In other words, we cannot jointly explain value and, and, uh, and earnings momentum. And we confirm this later on uh, in my paper with Laura at uh, Journal of Monetary Economics 2014, we confirm this, um, this uh, conjecture, the model uh, pretty much followed the same uh, research setup, we polished uh, uh, polished the measurement a little bit, and we switch from annual estimation to monthly estimation. And we polished, uh, in particular, the timing alignment. We use not the PPE GT, but you use, we use PPE NT for capital. And we show that uh, separately the model can, the baseline investment model can explain value and the price and earnings momentum separately, but we cannot explain value and the momentum simultaneously. Right. So, and uh, and later on, ten years later, in Concavus Xu and Zhang paper, we show exact aggregation. Uh, I will have to explain later on in a in a future presentation. And uh, and we also incorporate the working capital investment. We show the model um, a lot. You know, the the parameters still vary a bit. You know, only. Right, I mean, it's not literally constant, but uh, uh, but the model is able to explain jointly value and momentum investment and ROE premiums simultaneously. All right, so it's a it's a sizable improvement. So parameter instability is an important critique that we have taken very seriously. So ex ante versus ex post restrictions. So this question is a bit more philosophical, and that. I think we have addressed this issue reasonably well. Our original wording written in the paper, which is somewhat uh, in hindsight, somewhat unfortunate, we call our estimation equation weaker ex ante restriction. We say ex post state by state period by period restriction is like 100 R square prediction, extremely falsifiable. We call that strong. Right, but but is you know, and and we call that expected return moment condition as a weaker 
right? It's weaker only relative to 100% R square prediction. It's not the weaker, weaker per se, right? And keep in mind, we're using, we're basically turning weighted average cost of capital approach uh, uh, way to, to capital budgeting, turning that approach around as a surprising theory. And, uh, and that's effectively the net present value rule in corporate finance. And uh, when managers make their capital budgeting decisions, they don't know what their stock returns are gonna be, right? They are using X anti cost of capital, right? So we should be estimating X anti cost of capital. So it's not the weak restriction per se, it's as strong as the consumption cap band prediction, which is the X anti restriction, right? It's strong in that sense, is only weaker relative to the extreme case, right? So, and, uh, and that should be clarified on philosophical grounds. So again, so measurement errors mess up the exposed 100% R square prediction. Therefore, we should focus on signal, not the noise in our econometrics. The NPV rule point that I made earlier it's on. It's an economic point. The next point is econometric point, and I should also say that the ex post uh, 100 R square is actually a, some fascinating, intriguing feature, right? So keep in mind that it says investment return equals a bunch of things in the numerator, one of which is profitability, although we parameterize as sales over capital. Right in the data, I mean, you can also measure as earnings divided by or cash flow, cash flows divided by uh, some 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 measure of capital, especially earnings there. Right. So a lot of and this is a this is a this is a stronger prediction than the typical consumption cap and prediction that is only about expect return. This prediction is about exposed return. And that has some intriguing implication because a big chunk of anomaly profits are realized for a few days during few days surrounding earnings announcement dates. And this applies to uh, uh, Richard's, uh, Richard Sloan's famous accrual anomaly, right? Jagannishan Dittman price momentum, um, a post earnings announcement drift as well documented by Bernard Thomas, uh, LLSV, Right, Laporta, Lacona, Shock, Schreiber, Vishni, 1997, Journal of Finance article for the value premium, right? So, and uh, one of these days we may uh, put that paper together. Bottom line is that, so the investment cap M has some prediction about announcement date returns for anomalies, right? So it's a typical argument in the behavioral finance literature and says, look, all these anomalies are realized for a few days surrounding earnings announcement. It looks like, expectation or errors, that may well be the case, but another interpretation, especially explicitly predicted by the investment model, is that returns will move step by step with earnings news, right? So it will show up immediately in returns. So it actually gives the information flow, right? So, and uh, uh, so far, uh, I only have some general discussions in some of my papers. Um, one of these days, we may put the paper together to make that point. All right. So, and finally, this is a debate that is long lasting and uh, uh, it, will, it, will, it will take much longer, uh, I anticipate, than the more technical uh, issues like parameter instability, uh, like X anti versus X post, because this one is more what involves what Larry Loudon uh, calls world view. Okay, it's a serious, serious business. So Larry Loudon is a big, big time philosophy of science on the UT Austin faculty uh, in his uh, 1977 um, treaties on philosophy of science, uh, pro progress and its problems. He talked about the, uh, if you, you if you are developing a new research program, you gotta, if you, especially if you, <laughs> your, your program calls for a change in worldview, you gotta be very careful because you're gonna face all kinds of resistance. And that's that seems to be what I'm, I've been experiencing 
uh, since 2004. Uh, since I first figure out, figured out the investment model is actually, you know, seems to be a unified framework for asset pricing from the supply side. The, uh, more specifically, the debate is really, does the investment campaign explain anomalies? Okay, so uh, most of the time uh, when, 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 uh, when people think about explain anomalies, they are thinking from the CAPM and consumption CAPM perspective, right? So where, where are the betas? Where are the consumption betas? And later on, if I subscribe to that view, which I don't, although I'm sympathetic, if you take the Q factor model, right? Later on, we, we, we put that paper together. All the factor loadings, they have the same exact form as Pharma French 93, 96, right? So Pharma French go for the risk explanations. They say these are ICAPM, APT, risk factors, but we're not going there uh, because we we think in the back of my mind, I think, you know, it's it may not be necessary, all right? So, and my, my thoughts on this slide are preliminary. I'm still exploring the philosophical philosophy of science literature on scientific explanation. It's a gigantic literature. I was seeking clarity in philosophy. So I was trying to seek some clarity, some tools I could use in as a pricing to improve the clarity in my own area of uh, endeavor. In turns out in philosophy, things are equally messy, if not messier. All right. So this is uh, Carl Hempel's uh, influential work, 1965, Wesley Salmon. Uh, so uh, Hempel's work on the deductive nomological law, uh, also called the covering law model for scientific explanation, doesn't involve causality. Wesley Salmon came along, so causal mechanism model for scientific explanation. Philip Kitcher came up in 1989, came up with the unification definition of scientific explanation. So unification account seems to fit uh, the investment um, campaign literature pretty well. What Kitcher says is that, uh, how do you scientifically explain things, right? You explain some anomalies in one field using some law of nature in another field that we understand extremely well, right? In a sense, you unify the, 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 the anomalies in a different field that we don't understand with a law of motion that we have already understood pretty well in a different field. And that, that's unification. That seems to be what we have been doing in the investment capital literature, because we are saying all the all kinds of capital asset, um, asset pricing anomalies are reflections, are results from the, 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 the MPV rule in corporate finance. Right, or the weighted average cost of capital approach to capital budgeting or net present value rule in corporate finance. That's a law of nature. <laughs> That's a first principle. It's an inexact law of nature. I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I'm referencing Daniel Hausman's influential work in philosophy of economics, 1982, 92, 1992, uh, two books, inexact law of nature. Again, so the net present value rule in corporate finance, it's inexact or beat, but it's a law of, law of nature in economics. So we are, through our extensive empirical work in this body of work, in this, in this line of work, we're doing structural estimation. In the Q factor line of work, we're doing factor regressions. Through our extensive empirical work, we have, if not have already established, we have, we, we are on our way to establishing that um, that asset pricing anomalies are reflections of net present value rule in corporate finance. So this fits Philip Kitcher's unification definition of scientific explanation, all right? So, and doesn't involve consumption betas, although it looks like we are involving investment factor betas or ROE factor betas or expected growth beta factor betas, uh, but Right, but the reason is that whatever consumption cap and betas we insist on, or whatever the SDF loadings we insist on, right, and they they are owning your, they are owning the terminology perspective from the consumption cap and framework, consumption cap and research program, 
right? Thomas Kuhn's course, course in research paradigm, it looks like, you know, it's more grandiose than actually what we do. We're just working within our different research programs. Okay, so whatever STF risk premium or that insistence on finding out consumption betas and then, then you explain anomalies and that, that, that only applies to your research program. Right on top of that, after so many years of effort, my sense is that there's probably no solution. Right. So, and then uh, <laughs> because of all kinds of aggregation problem, if there's no solution, uh, philosophers of science will say it's not a test of skill for scientists. Right. All right. So, so um, investment capm is no more, no less causal than the consumption capm. For some reason, I have managed to persuade people on this point uh, because uh, because uh, uh, because uh, consumption betas, characteristics, and expected returns are all endogenous. So, uh, are all endogenous? There's no uh, causality running from one direction or another. Uh, although, although as noted earlier, I'm trying to figure out. I think. I think there may be some causality, but it's hard to say one model is more causal than the other. So causal mechanism in philosophy, Wesley Simon did the tongue of work. It turns out to be a pretty messy literature also. All right, but, um, but, uh, but I've got time, so. All right, so I need to figure that one out, um, trying to seek some clarity. The CVC test. Very, fam very influential in the um, uh, asset pricing literature, especially the empirical literature. So in my view, it's basically, uh, it's not about the uh, big uh, causal conclusion or mispricing versus rational ex or efficient markets. It's because in the investment model, it's all about the characteristics. Okay, it's all about accounting variables. So in, the, in our paper, in this 2009 JPE article, we don't even specify the pricing kernel. Right, so it's a it's a big departure, but but you need to go well, wherever the theoretical model takes you to, uh, even though it's 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 a uh, it's some exotic land that uh, that is not what we typically do as a pricing, but but it's corporate finance. <laughs> All right, so and uh, um, it's a different field. The Kitcher's unification account again. All right, so back to CVC test. So in my opinion, it's only about the measurement errors, which one is bigger. I think covariance has got more measurement errors in accounting variables. Not that accounting variables are perfect, but relative to covariances that we don't even know what we are measuring against, what, what exactly are the pricing kernel, kernel or kernels, right? So, and both, um, both side of the CVC test, they are both consistent with the efficient markets. All right, so before I conclude, I have this cool figure. It's, it's, a, it's a famous example in philosophy of science and from Thomas Kuhn's, uh, uh, you know, what, what Kuhn calls Gestalt switch and the incommensurability. But for now, let me ask you, let me ask the audience, what animal do you see out of this figure? I just counted the five Mississippis. So, all right. And uh, my first, on my first look, I'm seeing, I was seeing a duck, right? This is the eyes of the duck. This is the face. And this is the long beak of the duck. The duck is facing west. Then later on, I read the literature and uh, people say, hey, this is also a rabbit, right? So after, after learning the figure can be a rabbit, the photo could be a rabbit. It took me a long while, not a long while, took me a while like as in 10, 15 minutes of like, wow, this is really a rabbit, right? This is a rabbit. This is the eye of the rabbit, face of, the, this is the nose of the rabbit. The rabbit is facing east and the, the, the two long beak for the, for the duck turns out to be the long ears for the rabbit. See that? It's a duck and the rabbit. Or, or a rabbit. 
So this is what Thomas Kuhn calls Gestalt switch. Now keep in mind the figure cannot be a duck and simultaneously a rabbit. Cannot be both simultaneously. You take either one or another. Okay, so what this is what the philosophers call oftentimes different research programs are incommensurable because scientists working in different research programs were speaking with different languages. We are we have different notions of scientific explanations and we have different criterion of measuring success of our work. So that makes scientific progress kind of difficult, quite difficult. Oftentimes we even have communication problems. Uh, in fact, Power, Power Fireband, another famous philosopher of science, he jumps on the notion of incommensurability and declares that there's no scientific internal logic at all. If anything, anything goes. There's no, you know, scientific merits, no internal logic, no evidence, no nothing. So um, everything is, you know, networking and power and politics, um, right? Then later on, the sociology of uh, the sociologists of uh, of of uh, of science came along and uh, push uh, a Feynman thesis even further, okay? So um, and bottom line is that I just want to alert the reader that, you know, there may be some commensurability going on uh, that you can, in, you can, you, in a sense, you cannot insist on the investment capital literature to come up with beta evidence because it's not in our model, right? So it's, in, it's equivalent to us, to us enforcing that we are the firms in the, in the consumption capital framework. Right, so we understand, right? So even if EMI equals one fits, let's say fits um, uh, investment and ROE anomaly um, factors pretty well, portfolio, you still need to explain why consumption betas are lined up uh, with the investment and profitability. You cannot claim success right there, even though well, in the broader sense, even though within the consumption cap and framework, it is success, which I agree. Right, so it's like a duck or rabbit, um, right? I mean, keep in mind they cannot both be right, um, but but they can probably coexist. All right, so I'm ready to conclude. So in this paper, so we took a first step at GMMing the investment cap M. Uh, we end up concluding concluding that portfolios of firms do a good job in aligning their investment policies with cost of equity, cost of equity, and this alignment is underlying many characteristics, return relations in the data. Thank you for your attention. I will see you in a future presentation.